Chastity, I am just um, in awe um, of your leadership. I'm in awe of the moment that um, society and, and the world brings us um, to even have this conversation. So much is happening. So much is going on. Um, so much has always been going on. And, and people really are looking for direction. They're looking for insight. They're looking for hope. They're looking for belonging. They're looking for action. Um, and, and all of those are really, really important. And, and I think that the theme of this conversation, although centered on Black History Month, although centered on the, the connection um, between the spectrum of our identities, certainly within the Black community, um, it, it is a craving for direction on how we can craft and create a more just and equitable society. Um, that really reflects our diversity um, and all of the rich value that we all bring to the table. And so everyone, um, Chastity Vogue is uh, the, the president and um, leader of the Transgender Emergency Fund of Massachusetts. And uh, where's other hats? I, mean, I talk to people all the time, say Chastity's busy, book and busy. Um, and I know that so many people are going to benefit um, from what you have to say today and what this dialogue will unfold. And so Chastity, um, welcome um, on behalf of Pride in Our Workplace. Um, uh, happy Black History Month to you. And thank you for your leadership. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Thank you for having me and happy Black History Month. Yes, yes. So Chastity, let's start off by uh, unpacking context for people. Let's talk about where you're from. Let's talk about your family, your upbringing a little bit. What, what's the context that makes Chastity who Chastity is? So I was originally born, I was born and raised in Rochester, New York, upstate, um, to a single mom. Um, I was a middle child. And, you know, I was in one of those typical, typical Black households where, you know, you're taught you're taught that what happens in your house stays in your house. Even though, you know, we considered ourselves a Christian family, you know, went to church and things like that. But at an early age, I had something that was installed in me to make me believe that growing up, a group that I'm a part of is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I had a cousin who was married to a man, but then started dating a woman and considered herself bisexual, but the family, all they knew was, oh my gosh, she's a lesbian, she's going to hell. And at that time, younger, I knew I was different. You know, I knew like, why am I not wearing this dress that my sister's wearing? Or I already knew I was different. I just didn't know what it was called at the time, you know, as a young child. And as I got older, you know, me and my mom didn't have the best relationship due to substance abuse issues, which is another thing we don't talk a lot a lot about in the Black community. Thankfully, um, I pushed through my teenage years and that lesbian cousin that the whole family was against came to visit two weeks before my 18th birthday. And for whatever reason, her and my mom had it out and the police was called and something in me was like, leave, leave. Like something was like in my soul told me like, you should leave with your cousin, leave, leave. And so I packed as much as I could within those 30 minutes. And next thing I know, I was on the road to Massachusetts. And immediately once I got here, I was like, cousin, I'm different. And I explained to her how I felt inside. And she was like, oh, I already knew. I was just waiting for you to tell me. And so it was something that she saw in me um, that she knew I was different, but she felt like, okay, yeah, it's, she's going to come to me when she's ready. And that I did. Yeah. So that's what got me here. Um, and nevertheless, I thought this is my way to be able to start my transition without the pressure of my immediate family. But boy, was I in for a surprise. Uh, because it's not all easy. It's not, it's, not, it's not that path like, okay, now you know what you want and everything's laid out for you. There was no blueprint. There was no like no handbook and say, hey, you're transitioning. Here are the steps you should follow. That didn't exist. It still technically doesn't exist because everybody's transition is different. But I think what we're looking for is just that oversight guidance. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, 2003, fast forward to 2005, I had graduated from high school here in Boston and started my transition and met someone who I thought was gonna be the love of my life. To him, he's like, I feel you this way, but I, I don't know about me. So I just wanna keep this between you and I until I figure myself out. 
one year turned into two years, turned into three years, which turned into a, an abusive relationship. In a point in my transition now, I'm getting fired from job and job. You know, it's like, oh, it's not working out. It's not a good fit. Um, but one job that I was able to sustain because I was really good at it was a manager at uh, BPNE, which is a valet company here in Boston. But I was being harassed every day at work. And one of the, I said, the most hurtful things that happened there was being called to the office and them telling me like, oh, we're getting complaints from the women in the female's restroom, wondering why um, a cross dresser is using the women's restroom. And these are more so Black cisgender women who are um, who are complaining at the time. Mm-hmm. We'll we'll touch on that. We'll unpack that. We will unpack that. Um, and so imagine someone who's being verbally harassed at work, and then you go home and you're being physically abused by your partner. So it's like I had no outlet. And after six years, I don't know. I found some type of courage to want to leave. And so one night, I don't know. Caught my crazy self called the police thinking I was gonna have some help so they come and they look at our IDs and they're chuckling amongst each other um and this was a a Latin uh, officer and a cisgender black female officer and they're chuckling looking at the license so he comes over and he's like oh well I just want to let y'all know this is not a domestic violence case this is just two men having a disagreement and they left me there with him so now imagine me leaving the next day and saying, to this point, I will stay at a shelter. And then I go down to a local shelter here in Boston and women's shelter. And once I say, like, I am a trans woman, her next question out of her mouth, and this is another, yet another Black cisgender woman who's supposed to be an advocate. Oh, how long have you been HIV positive? When, where did I say, when? Wow. I had to look in, I literally, because that's just my personality, I'm looking at my phone. I got something written on my forehead. That's it. Let me make sure I, I didn't miss something. Right. And, and for me, who is new to transitioning, new to the community, and like already having the fears and stigmas about HIV, because that's why all my family was screaming at me when they found out, like, oh, you're going to die from AIDS. And, and so that made me get up and walk out the door. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know where I was going. The job was long gone at this point, because... I'm only gonna take so much at work as well. And when we speak up and voice our opinions, especially as black women and black trans women, oh, she's angry, she's aggressive, and we can't have that at the workplace. So now I'm out here on these streets with no navigation. Um, nobody who looked like me to help me navigate that waters. It took a friend to tell me about the trans emergency fund that was based in Worcester um, at the time. And I'm like, yeah, I'll give him a call. Like, I'll give him a call. What am I gonna get a slice of pizza and an HIV test? Like, that's all they want us for, is for numbers. And so it took me two weeks to call and I call after it was a very traumatic experience one night indulging in survival sex work. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna call. And I called the next day. He got me a, a commuter rail ticket to Worcester, put me in a hotel for the weekend and I would that weekend I was so nervous, like, okay, what is this? This ain't gonna really happen. Is this am I gonna have to sleep with this with my end for him to pay for this room? Um, and that was still me having that mentality of I'm just here to be used. I'm just here to be used. I am just a sex object because that's what is built into our heads, especially once you transition. Like, oh, you're just, yeah, that's all you are. Um, but that was not the case. Uh, after that weekend, he had found a room where the trans emergency fund paid the rent for three months which allowed me to just get chastity back together and figure out what do I want out of this life? And that I trying to, trying to rebuild that self-esteem that I once had. Um, And so I say this to this day, if it wasn't for the trans emergency fund, I probably wouldn't be here having this conversation with you today. So it literally saved my life. Um, And a full circle. Just two weeks ago, I had to go place a girl in a hotel after a traumatic incident. It's like, uh-huh. it keeps happening that way. And I think that's a reminder, like, okay, you're put in this position to continue to help these people that are in these situations or even worse situations than I was in. And to be able to help them out, it, it, to me, that's what brings it full circle. That's what keeps me motivated. It keeps me going. And it just, it hasn't been easy, you know, between 2015 when I became the volunteer director until now in June 2020, becoming T a first pay staff, into now having five staff members and, and trying to 
get an apartment to get homeless folks off the street now until we get our building and our house for homeless trans and gender non-conforming people. So it's like these experiences that I had as a childhood, uh, being homeless here in Boston, um, navigating the workforce, and no matter how big the God see, the Lord sees for me to be, I'm always going to come back to my I'm always going to make sure I'm checking in, going to support groups for trans folks and sitting down, making sure I'm hearing their stories. Because what happened to me in 2012, the devastation those two years that I was devastated, is different. It's, it's different now than 2022. So the girls who are homeless now, I need to know what they need now, the resources they need. And because we're still not where we need to be. So yeah. we need there to be a trans emergency fund of Georgia, a trans emergency fund of LA. Like we need these people, these places, because as far as we know, we are the only ones in the country who are specifically assisting folks with financial assistance to stay in their apartment, paying four back months of rent, paying first and last to get into an apartment, utility. So I think that once more folks jump on, once we have equal housing, then we can work on employment, then we can step by step. And so I feel like, yeah, if you out there and you're doing some big things and you have that power and some influence, remember to give some of that back mm-hmm. to your communities because we need it. Yeah. yeah, that's that that that's so powerful and and so important. And and I hope that people who are watching this will take that to heart and and take it to the bank and 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 cash it and really get active in that way and intentional um, in that way with their leadership. My board would like to say we're focusing on housing utilities, but on a, that flip side of that, we're focusing on sustainability. And, yeah. and that goes why we're working with the Black Men Foundation, why we're having special retreats for our community, because they have to know their, if nobody tells you you're worthy and what you're capable of, sometimes you will never get it. And exactly. we don't get, we didn't get that from our, some of our parents when we got kicked out at 17, mm-hmm. 18. We don't know how to balance a checkbook. How should I show up in the interview? What is writing a resume or what is a cover letter? That's mm-hmm. up to us to provide these, these life skills to help sustain our community. Now, when it comes to the Black and all of this, I have to pause for a minute. Yeah. But let me say this first and foremost. I love my Black people. I love my Black men. I just wish they loved me. Ah, that's real. I mean, and it's, and, it's, and it's so truthful because some of these conversations that I've had with cisgender black men who didn't cisgender straight black men who didn't know I was trans at first glance and it's like oh yeah I was gonna move to Atlanta and but it's too many of them the men dressed like women down there and I'm like well what do you mean transgender people mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah them them I'm like well I'm trans and this to see somebody's whole dynamic change like yeah mind blown like mind blown and backing up like I'm contagious or something and it's like my brother um, you, you was so, cool just a few seconds like, ago. <laughs> we, listen, this was a coworker. He would mind you, we would come to my office like, "Hey, what's going on?" and just a cool relationship. And then now all of a sudden, you see me go the other way. So like, how can we break it yeah. down? And yeah. how can you say I, I had this one bad experience with a trans woman, but I'm not gonna lump them all in that category to where I had that bad experience. And same for us. Like I had that one bad experience with that black man. Now I'm done with all of them. We can, mm-hmm. can't do that to each other. Because the more we do that to each other, it's, it's giving our oppressors exactly what they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. We got Black men killing each other. We got Black men killing trans women. We got trans women now fighting each other. We got gay men now who think they can fight trans women. All that. It's like, okay, people, listen here. It's so much shit going on in this country. And this is what we worried about. Like, can we come together as people? Like, see me as human first. See me as human first. See me as Black. Get my transgender, forget that I'm transgender. Like, I'm just another Black human, just like you. We're asking for proper mutual respects from one Black human being to another. And I'm trying to figure out why is that so hard to understand. Um, but I think the next step for us here is to start having those conversations. That when you consider yourself an ally, that means you're fighting to make sure that your so called friends with un- in this umbrella have the same opportunities that you do and the same access to resources yeah. that you do. You see that your people post, oh, these poor black trans women keep getting murdered. Oh, this is so sad. Oh, we gotta do, oh, they need to stop. But what are you doing? What are you doing? Because it's not gonna help us by you just typing in your keyboard. Like, 
Did you call your local rep representatives? When the last time you've been to your state house to see how your state feels about policies and laws that need to be in place to protect trans and gender non-conforming people? It's like, what have you done to call yourself an ally? Because it's more than just saying, I have a trans friend or I have a gay friend. They so cool, they know how to shop. Oh, they know how to cook. No, like stop trying to use us for our special talents because we are highly divine individuals and see us as human. And why can't we have the same things that you have? Why should we have to struggle for employment and housing and adequate healthcare? People think about innovation only from a business and entrepreneurship standpoint, but thinking about what it takes for a person to make it from day to day, it takes innovation. Um, when you are running up into hurdles, when you're having to navigate communities and, and systems where that have not been built with you in mind, that has not considered you to be a valuable centerpiece. Um, it takes innovation um, to figure out how you're gonna eat, how you're gonna make money, how you're going to build up support systems and create a pathway to success for yourself. Um, and uh, Chastity, you are the example of innovation in that way. So I wanna talk a little bit about innovation um, and what innovative things do you see happening um, to further um, um, our communities? Um, what innovative things do you see that's helping to strengthen and, and unify us? I'm gonna break it down for you when it comes to how we can get our people together. And when I say our people, I mean Black people as a whole, regardless of your orientation, your gender, because we're not gonna get any movement done within the Black community until we start to unite. And I started That's thinking, it. me and Martin Henson, um, wonderful one over man of uh, the president of B-Man Foundation, we start having these conversations, right? Like, why can't other trans women of color, Black men like me, have these conversations that me and you are having one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm like, so let's do it. Like, let's have these dinner and discussions with straight Black men and trans women of color. And out of that, which I'm not surprised because I already knew some of it, which was, oh, I was raised that if a man dressed like a woman that's nasty, they're going to hell, they're gay. Oh, my baby mother told me if I look at a trans woman, I'm nasty and I'm gay. And it's like some of these same little things kept coming up over and over and over again. We are hoping to take these conversations on the road. So hopefully, you know, we'll get some sponsors and then me and Martin will be in the road in the cities that need us the most, like ATL, Houston, all the cities where we are being killed the most and, and start having that conversation and breaking down those stigmas and stereotypes. Um, another thing to be... Anybody can be innovative, but it's all about being intentional with your innovation. Yeah. And so yeah. I would encourage people to be more intentional about the, space, the spaces that you take up, being more intentional about going to spaces that you're predominantly not welcomed in, but you have the opportunity to be in. So take that opportunity. So for example, for me, I always wanted to be a part of the NAACP. And I'm like, oh, they, you know what? But my deterrence has always been I am black. I'm, well, I'm trans. That's the problem. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think I'm gonna be accepted. And I had the opportunity to sit on a panel recently with the president of NAACP of, of Massachusetts. And, you know, now I was given the opportunity of a lifetime membership. And I'm going to use that membership to create space for people like yeah. me and to change yeah. minds of those who currently are members of the NAACP. Because even in that president having Everyone in NAACP is not trans friendly <laughs> or, you know, or LGBTQI friendly at all. So I think it's part of us to be innovative. We have to start being intentional about the spaces that we take up so we can start making people uncomfortable because uncomfortableness is what is going to make change. You got some amazing people, amazing activists across this country doing some dope work, right? But where are our allies? Where are, where, where are they? Why are they not lifting us up? It is a lot of white, gay, cisgender men that are in politics that can really make some moves and assist us in moving forward, but they're not. Shout out to, um, I have to give a shout out to Senator Sear here in Massachusetts. He is one that is making moves for the trans community, but that's not enough. And we have to start holding these politicians accountable for what they say they're gonna do. 
So for example, I'm happy to say the Trans Emergency Fund and a few a lot, few other organizations um, across the country, we sued the previous White House administration and that lawsuit is still, ongo- is still going on. Um, shout out to the National Women's Law Center in DC who is representing us because in just the most unjust thing, right? is to pull a fast one on a community that's already facing so much injustice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at the same time, the tragic death of, tragic murder of George Floyd, right? During that time, behind the scenes, the White House at the time went on ahead and, and pushed it, tried to put a bill in place that will allow insurance agencies and physicians to pretty much discriminate against trans folks. Like, I don't want to cover that surgery. We're not paying for that. We don't want to see this type of individuals. And thank God we all came together and put that and put that a stop to that, a halt. Mm-hmm. Because everybody else was so wrapped up in what's going on, mindfully so. And these are the things we have to be cautious about and intentional about about listening and knowing what is going on. I'm, I hate the news, but I have to watch it. This is like, you're, I need to know what is going on. Otherwise you'd be out the loop. Out the loop, and next thing you know, you, they done repealed one of your rights that you had. You ain't even know. You blink twice and it's gone. <laughs> and so I think we have to be very intentional about educating our people on what is what, what they need to know. I think that we are so far removed when it comes to voting that we need to be innovative as people of color on how we educate folks why it's so important to vote. You know, we may know a little bit about Congress or a little bit about the president. Um, but knowing our local officials is paramount um, to our daily striving, our daily thriving. Um, we, we have to know these things. And so I even encourage um, people that are running for office, um, one, um, to really center your campaigns around information and educating um, your community through that, not just getting their vote, um, because mm-hmm. that's the shortcut. Um, we have to be building community as we're running these campaigns and dare I encourage and put a charge out to more people of color and women and transgender people to run for office and for people to back them, support them, donate to them, volunteer for them um, to ensure that they get the support that they need uh, to win. And that's at every level, including um, some of our gatekeepers um, who certainly are um, uh, um, deciding what resources are being allocated, what candidates are being backed in the first place. Especially being here in Massachusetts, AKA the money state, so they say, is so much funds here and there's so many buildings going up. Like every month there's a new building that we can't afford. And it just, it, it, it frustrates me, but it also makes me work harder. Like, no, we're gonna get a building of our own and house homeless folks that you don't wanna do. And it's like, I don't understand how states can be against shelters and, and I mean, be against transitional housing programs, what we're trying to create, but they just want shelters or permanent housing. But let me just give you some data on that. Shelters don't work. They make you kick you out at 7 a.m. And for us, we go to a women's shelter, they say, you don't sound woman enough. Oh, you have a mustache, we can't allow you in here. Or they allow us in and they let other guests be abusive to, to us, open the doors up while we're in the bathroom. And then, oh, we go to the men's shelter because that's what's in our ID. Now we're being raped. So no, we create in the space that we need for ourselves. And then you're taking homeless people and you put them in permanent housing. They're dying within two months, overdosing in their apartments. Guess what? There was no transition period mm, mm, to mm. give them the tools and resources needed to be able to sustain that apartment. Mm. And it's like, is that what you want? And you think about this system, I'm telling you, we, it's not so, it's not set up for us, to, for us to surpass what they want us to surpass. They want us to be stagnant. And as another example, this federal housing, like I was on the list for about 10 years, finally came up on the list about five years ago. And they was like, oh, well, I can't tell you this, but in order to get in this unit, you know, you have three jobs. So you, I, we can't tell you to quit, but you know, in order to qualify, you will only have to be working this job right here. Mm-hmm. Man, so you, you want to really be broken. So you want to stifle my income. But on top of that, I was told, and you can't go just back to school full time. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. You want to limit my income. You want to limit my education. So that means you want me to be stuck in this subsidized unit forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. You keep that. I'll work my three jobs and pay market rent and figure it out. And figure it out mm-hmm. because 
that's how they are. Some of our people are being stagnant and stuck and used to the same thing and being comfortable. We have mm-hmm. to make our people feel uncomfortable. Is that is that all you're comfortable with? Mm-hmm. You know, and I understand a lot of our people wasn't given the tools. Our parents wasn't given the tools. Their parents wasn't given the tools. So it's a generational issue that we're dealing with. And it's going to be very hard to break down, but nothing is impossible. And nothing so, is impossible. Nothing. nothing is impossible. Nothing. And like I said, like I like to say, my my newest thing is I'm my ancestors' wildest dream and their oppressors' worst nightmare. And I'm not yes indeed. Yes indeed. And I need other people to 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 feel that that fire and that burn and know that you're worthy. Like ours, we are melon, melanin magic. Like, do you understand? Yes. Like obviously they brought us here for a reason because we get shit done. So, and have been getting stuff done since we've been here. Yes, and so it's gonna take a it's gonna take some time, but I know I'm up for the fight. Jonathan, you sound like you up for the fight. You know, we gotta we gotta do what we gotta do to make sure people know that we matter, make sure we understand that we matter. Like I have to tell myself in the mirror every night, like Chastity, you are enough. What you did today is enough because doing so much, it makes me like I got it. Oh my god, I didn't make this email and this and it can stress you out and then it can burn you out. And if I'm burned yeah. out, then my community is going to be let down. So I have yeah. to pace myself. I think we all do and just remind ourselves, you are enough. Our people are enough. And if they don't think they're enough, we're going to show them that they are enough. And, yeah. that's with, and that's only with community, love, education, and guidance. Like, that's the only way we're going to get there. Yeah, that's that's so key. And like, we're it's Black History Month. And and this conversation is happening um, during Black History Month. And as much as you know, people sometimes reflect on history and the oppression that Black folk have had to um, continue to navigate through, um, you know, this is also a time where we celebrate the contributions um, that we've made to our collective pro- uh, progression, we've made to US history, um, we've made to our societies. And I think it's just so important that in addition to talking about our accomplishments, that we not forsake the opportunity to hype ourselves up. We, that we don't forget and mistake the opportunity, forsake the opportunity um, to really invest in our sense of worth and value and belonging and empoweredness because that is what's gonna to continue to take us through. So I appreciate you for like honing in there um, in, in reminding black folk, um, not only that we're beautiful, um, but that we're bountiful, that we're blessed. Um, and, and that we have brilliance out of this world. Um, when we think about um, how we continue to be innovators every step of the way. So let's let's have switch gears just real quick as we um, get ready to close out with a uh, lightning round. And I want to um, learn some of your favorite things. And so this is Black History Month edition. So tell me what your favorite um, soul food or African American cuisine is? Mm. It would be fried chicken and mac and cheese. Yes, yes. Do you like your fried chicken like with a lot of bread or like light batter? I would say light batter, but it has to be soaked in the buttermilk to get it. Into yeah. The egg. <laughs> So when you bite into it, you 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 taste the savor. You, you that season that I love it. All right. So what's your favorite song, or or Ooh. or or artist? I would have to say Janet Jackson. Come on. Um, everything. Yes, Janet yesterday, too. Yesterday was um Janet Jackson Appreciation Day. I had my sweater on and everything. Um, Janet Jackson. She she that's true resilience. That's a mega star. You know, Beyonce's yeah. a superstar. Jane is a mega star, you know, and I yeah. love Beyonce too. I'm gonna be high, so don't come for me. Right, look, but, I, look um, I'm not gonna respond too much. I'm, I'm, right, <laughs> but um, she, the things that she went through as a black woman, and being in not only being in Michael's shadow, but things that he went through that kind of derailed her career. And listen, I, I, I every Jane song is my song. Okay, yeah, her alone like that. Oh yes, that is, <laughs> she is everything for me when it comes to music yeah shout out to janet and the, the documentary was so enlightening so enlightening i'm watching and it again this watch it, y'all go watch it um, go watch it it was so enlightening and uh, um, really leveled um heightened my respect and admiration for janet 
Um, absolutely. Um, Janet is living legend for sure. Um, and, and definitely black history, black history. Um, all right, so tell me what your favorite historical, you said Janet, but maybe you have a different answer for this, but your favorite historical figure. Mm, I will have to say Marsha P. Johnson. Mm. Um, I've done so much research on her. I feel like I still can't get enough. Like I don't know enough. And because her resilience to push through after Stonewall and didn't stop. Um, I think about that, if not daily on a weekly basis, because it kind of gives me that motivation because don't get it. Don't get it twisted. I still have a lot of people telling me you can't do this and you're not going to do that. And nope, they let you get here because now they want you here and they tokenize you. And I block all of that out. Like, no, yeah, yeah. you're not going to limit me to where I'm at now. I have so many more places to go and so many more people to help. So I continue to think about Marsha and all the time, pay it no mind, Johnson. And I continue to pay it no mind <laughs> and do what I have to do for my community. So yeah, she's definitely number one for me. So tell me what your favorite black owned business in Boston is. I would have to say Tasha Michelle. So it's a boutique um, mm -hmm. in Dorchester, uh, Dorchester Ave. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see some of her pieces. Uh, but this was a boutique that I loved the first and foremost, black owned, um, Caribbean black owned. And at first, when I first went in, you know, I would just make my little purchases and keep, keep it moving because I'm like, you know, us trans Black folks who are not Caribbean, you know, we feel some sort of way like, are we going to be judged? Because they, they have harsher views when it comes to trans folks. And then one day I just happened to meet the owner. Um, I was in there and she's like, oh, I heard about you when you come here and buy my pieces. And I went to your Instagram. And I see the work you do. I would love to do lunch with you. And it was so eye-opening, shocking, and also provided me some education because having, I can't lump all Caribbean people in that category and think they're going to have an issue with us. And that yeah. she proved that stereotype wrong. Like, no, I want to conversate. I want to know how can we help each other? And, and it's little things like that that opens doors for each other. Like, oh, okay, you see me and I, I see you. Let's yeah. see each other. And so um, that is definitely one of my number ones. So one last thing that I want to ask you, especially as you are getting ready to do more consulting, um, I'm sure that there are going to be companies, employers, um, who are also going to be leaning on your expertise, your own experiences to help inform how they should navigate and create more equitable support systems, certainly for um, um, their diverse workforce, but definitely those people who are transgender. Um, so what are some of the tips? What are some of the charges um, and challenges that you have for employers, for the workforce um, to make our workforce more equitable and, and places of belonging for transgender people? And places where they can also thrive and see themselves in management and leadership roles, making decisions um, in, in our workforce. Definitely, I would have to say they have to start with creating the opportunity visually. And it's a lot of companies now who have started to, even on their websites, or if you're going walking by, they make sure they have a sign that shows that they are inclusive. Like we are inclusive of hiring LGBTQIA folks. Like sometimes we need to see that because we've been told no so many times that we've stopped going into certain places looking for employment. So first and foremost, we need to, be aware that we're welcome <laughs> for employment there. But then also, you can't just give us in and say, we gave them a job, so we feel good. But you're not giving me the same tools and resources as my white counterpart to be yeah. sustainable. So help me, us be sustainable as well. Give us those trainings to help us be better so then we can possibly qualify for a promotion in the future. Um, and I think it's up to employers also to have to spend that money for the right training for your staff to be diverse in not only just trans 101, but cultural sensitivity, intersectionality, like how do you incorporate that into your organization? Um, and that's where I come in. I can be hired, Ms. Chastity at gmail.com to facilitate these conversations. Uh, one of the trainings I'll never forget was um, Bridgewater State Corrections. And we were training the correction officers on how to be inclusive because they had a correction officer who was transitioning on the job. It was the most eye-opening experience ever because this is one of my first trainings years ago. And I just was so enamored that they were so 
riled up about this individual that you don't even work with. Like it was the first shift I was training and the person works um, the second shift. You see this person in passing. You don't even change in the locker room with this person, but you're so worried about what they're doing in their booth and their stall in the locker room. And it just made me realize that sometimes employers have much more in their hands than what they can handle. Yeah. And that's why they have to have strict policies and rules in place to protect everyone on the job. Mm-hmm. Because it's that one person in that training that no matter what anybody said to her, she was not changing her mind about how she felt about this type of people. And then maybe that's not a person you want working for your company. Yeah. It's that yeah, simple. Especially after you provided intensive trainings and they still can't understand that you're here to do a job just like this person is here to do a job. Sometimes you have to let it go. That's, that's so powerful and that's so important. And it's, you know, holding true, setting out what your values are and holding true to them, sticking mm-hmm. with them. Don't change your values um, because the circumstance um, got you feeling uncomfortable or having you to make difficult choices. That's when you stick to those values and, and say, this is what we stand for. Um, I think that's really important. And we have to be willing to do that because we don't then we're just gonna to continue to see the same thing continue to happen um, and we not make the necessary progress that we need to make for. And our, all of our companies and workforces, everybody wanna work for a company with integrity at the end of the day. Um, and, and, and we deserve that um, to, to be in environments full of integrity. Chastity, thank you for all of your contributions um, to our collective progression. Um, and PIOW is proud um, to, um, feature you today in this conversation um, to expose other people to the work that you're doing um, so that they can continue to learn from you. Uh, Pride in Our Workplace is New England's premier organization championing LGBTQ plus workforce um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we provide all LGBTQ plus uh, professionals with ways to amplify their voices and create thriving workplace cultures. And we're so grateful that leaders like Chastity is out here leading that change and someone that you can call on um, to get expertise and insight on how to make your businesses, your companies, your workforces um, more equitable, more diverse, more inclusive. And and so I encourage you to do just that. And in this time of Black history, which is not just during February, we need to be intentional about this year round, century round, millennial round. Um, thinking about how we uplift those with their backs against the wall. And so it's my honor today that we've had the opportunity um, to sit and have this conversation. Chastity, thank you for wishing you all the best.